I'm Rama Ramanathan, a writer and activist in Malaysia. I spend my days attending public hearings and writing about them. At the end of my second year in university, I became a disciple of Christ. After I graduated in 1982, I worked in several companies, first in engineering, then in quality management. I retired in 2014. From 2015 till 2018, I was active in Bursay 2.0, the movement for free and fair elections and parliamentary democracy in Malaysia. I also wrote weekly opinion pieces for two news portals. I wrote about poverty, politics, governance, and religion. In 2017, some friends and I formed an NGO called CAGED, which stands for Citizens Against Enforced Disappearances. That was our response to the disappearances of Pastor Joshua Helmi and his wife Ruth Sitepu, of Pastor Raymond Ko, and of the Shiite social activist Amri Chekmat. In 2020, for about six months, I was a writer for an NGO called EDICT, which stands for Eliminating Deaths and Abuse in Custody Together. So I'm a storyteller. I use real-life stories to expose wrongs and call for justice and reforms. What have I achieved? I don't think I've achieved much in my six years of activism. Some people have told me my articles helped them learn in a few minutes what happened over a whole day in court, unlike media reports which only report juicy parts of hearings. They also appreciate that I include prophet-like condemnations in my articles. Perhaps the second thing I've achieved is that I've been investigated by the police several times, mainly because I organized or spoke at public protests, but once because of an article I wrote which went viral. Perhaps the third thing is that my writing and speaking may have helped some Christians connect faith with justice. I don't know. Basically, I think I've achieved very little. What inspired me to do what I do now? In 2008, I boarded a taxi after landing in Singapore. The driver asked me where I was from. When I said KL, he asked me what I thought of the Hindroff protest in KL the previous week. I had to admit I didn't know what happened on that day and I didn't know why they protested. I didn't know because I didn't pay attention to what happened in the world. I rarely watched or read the news. I had few friends in KL, since I had a regional job and I was always overseas. I was a regular churchgoer. I never missed a service. I was always at the Saturday morning prayer meetings. I even attended classes for a master's in theology, and my lecturers rated me highly. But that conversation with that taxi driver made me realize that I was not a good disciple. I saw that I had become trapped in the work culture in my company. My world was a cage, 14 hours a day, six days a week. I began to feel that being comfortable in my church was a bad thing. My wife agreed, but we didn't know where to go. One day a friend suggested we attend a service in her church on the day after the 2008 general election. That was the year the ruling party lost its two-thirds majority in Parliament. For reasons I won't go into, we decided, for the first time ever, to go to a Sunday service in a church not our own. We were pleasantly surprised that one of our former pastors, Tan Su In, was the preacher. Even better, during the service, several church members came up to give testimonies. My jaw dropped when I heard what they said. They spoke about the role they played as counting and polling agents during the election on the previous day. At the end of the service, I showed the pastor, Sivin Kit, the wallpaper I had on my smartphone. I was so happy that he instantly recognized the man whose photo I used as wallpaper. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor theologian who was executed by Hitler and who's a great inspiration for me. Since that day, we've attended Bangsa Lutheran Church, BLC. One evening in 2009, we attended a presentation in BLC about deaths in custody in Malaysia. It was in the wake of the death of Teo Beng Hock, who was found dead after he was interrogated by anti-corruption officers. The main presenter was Dr. Wong Chin Huat. I was so shocked by what he said that I challenged him. But he stood up to my challenge. He convinced me that between 2003 and 2009, 1,805 persons died in custody. That led me to write some articles. These were published on the MICA Mandate website. Then, at the suggestion of Sakti, a seminary librarian whom I met at a public event, I started my blog, Rest Stop Thoughts. It's had over a million page views. I've told you about how the Hindraf protest and the death of Teo Beng Hock changed my life. 
Now I'll tell you one more, perhaps the main one, the immoral detention of the EO6. In 2011, six members of the Socialist Party of Malaysia, PSM, were falsely accused of organizing the Berse 2 rally. They were held under the Emergency Ordinance, or EO. The EO allowed for permanent detention without trial. During that period, I wrote one of my most viral articles, titled, Why am I attending vigils for the EO6 and Dr. Jayakumar? It was later included in the book, The Bible and the Ballad, published by Graceworks. That article was spurred by a reporter who thrust a mic in my face while I was standing with protesters outside the police headquarters. She asked me why I attended the protest every evening for four weeks, photographed by the special branch. I pushed the mic away because I couldn't answer. I only knew that the spirit compelled my wife and I to attend. My inability to answer prompted me to search for answers. I came across Eugene Peterson's book, Reverse Thunder. You may recall that Eugene Peterson is author of the Bible translation called The Message, a very popular translation. Peterson gave me the insights I needed to understand the prompting of the Spirit and write my article. Since then, I've read much which can help explain why I do what I do and encourage others to do the same. Other authors I found helpful include James Gillen, Jim Wallace, John Stott, Chris Wright, and many more. So, I've been inspired by stories of injustice in the daily news, by the Bible, by pastors and theologians, both living and dead, and people I've met at public meetings. What can you do? Perhaps you're intrigued or inspired by what I've said. If you are, and you'd like to explore further, I have three suggestions. First, meditate on these words by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We are not to simply bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice. We are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. Second, join the Facebook pages of NGOs like Caged, Swaram and Edict. Through their pages, find out about public hearings and attend them. Write or make videos about what you hear. Share what you produce. Also share their stories on social media. Invite their reps to speak to your groups. Help them raise funds. Volunteer your time. Third, read a book. My current favorite is Call for Justice, From Practice to Theory and Back. It's by Kurt Verbeek and Nicholas Volterstoff. It's an exchange of short letters between Kurt in Honduras and Nick in the USA. It's an easy read because, well, it's always nice to read other people's mail. Kurt is a member of the faculty of Calvin College in the USA, though he moved from the USA to Honduras decades ago. He's one of the founders of ASJ, a Honduran NGO whose members strive to be brave Christians. They work to make the Honduran government work better, especially for the most vulnerable. Through personal storytelling, Kurt documents the many successes of ASJ. Kurt's co-author, Nick, taught at Calvin College before moving to teach philosophy at Yale University. In the book, he briefly and grippingly tells of his involvement in campaigns against social injustice in the USA, Israel, and South Africa. He gives, in simple terms, a biblical way to think about the work of AJS. The book shows how to think biblically in the midst of trouble. Now I'll conclude. There's much injustice in Malaysia, and the work of derailing injustice is a thrilling way to live as disciples of Christ the King. I leave you with one final thought, inspired by Jim Wallace, founder of Sojourners, the social justice movement in the USA. With our campaigning, we create the prophetic direction of the wind that politicians may follow. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, thank you, Malaysian Care and Michael Malaysia, for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you about the two areas of my life, work and my faith. I'm going to start my presentation with this quote. Man is a creature of broken relations. Broken relations with God, broken relations with man, and broken relations with nature. What we see now today is mostly from the consequence 
of these broken relationships. When Cain replied to God about Abel, am I my brother's keeper? It is said not a leap, am I this world's keeper? And so here we are today, living in a world that is broken as a result of our own work. Some of you may ask, how did I start in this field? In 1999, I was 25 years old, newly hired as a junior scientific officer in one of the local NGOs in KL. I was elated. I was on cloud nine. I was ready to get to work to save the world. And what I mean is saving the wildlife, the plants, and the forests. So naturally, I mostly failed at my job. I had to learn that while it was efficient and convenient to work on my mission and focus on my task, I had completely missed my mark. Ultimately, while the mission is to reduce our impact on nature, nature was really not the ones calling the shots. So I learned one of the most important lessons, which is it is about the people. Case in point, this conference. I'm speaking to you now about my experiences because I'm hoping that by doing this, I can possibly change your minds and influence your behavior and how as Christians, we are to view God's creation and our role in it. I'm not out there talking to a bunch of potted plants or in the zoo because they were not the ones created in God's image, nor were they given a command to have dominion of the efficiency, the birds of the air, and every living thing that walks on this earth. We are. It is the people's decisions and people's actions that affect our nature. And I think this applies to other areas of work as well, right? Especially when you have a mission or a task. It's just so easy to put our nose to the grindstone so we can complete it quickly and efficiently. But then you would also be missing mark. Because even as we're commanded to be focused on our mission, it will be meaningless if we forget the second command, which is to love one another as Christ loved us. And this takes me to my second point. Working in this field is a team sport. A lot of times there will be overlaps, especially if you're working in a common area or common goal. The conservation field usually works over a particular area of interest, like the forest. Uh, in that particular area, there could be many issues, like poaching, logging, clearing of forest for plantations. There could also be poor villages in that area which do not have access to water, electricity, and ways to support themselves. The government may respond by planning to build hydroelectric dams, roads, and put in an area for factories. And you'll find a situation happening in many parts of Asia as countries struggle to ensure that their people will not go hungry and their children do not grow up ignorant. There can be no one person who is an expert in everything, which is why it always has to be a team effort. And it takes all types. So whenever I'm asked, you know, on the type of training, Required to work in conservation, to me, it really doesn't matter. You can be someone trained in communications or marketing or social enterprise or law. Everyone can play a part as long as they understand and share a common goal, which is to the reconciliation of broken relations to man, to nature, and ultimately to God. And this leads me to my final point for today. If you're going into this field, it will be extremely advantageous to have God along for the ride. I mentioned earlier that when I started, I was idealistic. I was on cloud nine. It's just something very ego boosting about trying to save the world. It's easy to get lost in fantasies. And this is where the danger lies. The myth that we can find the solution or that we are in any way in control. And that was one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn. In our lifetime, we will witness the extinction of two species of rhinos in Asia, the Javan and the Sumatran rhino. 
Well, there are still a little over more than 80 individuals left in protected areas in Indonesia. Unfortunately, they don't like to make babies, you know. So if the trend continues, they will die out in the next 40 to 50 years. We will not see another leatherback turtle landing onto the shores in Rantau Abang because uh, no eggs have been laid, laid there for the last 10 years. And even if we were to stop all our factories, vehicles, and heavy industries right now from emitting greenhouse gases, the earth will still be going through climate change. Unfortunately, that will not be the last of the bad news. When the last rhino in Sabah died, it hit me really hard. Not that I was friendly with the rhino, didn't know her, but it brought home a realization how little of my work actually changed things. And no matter how much I try, it will be a losing battle. All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put Humpty Dumpty together again. There can be no solution within us that can address this decay and brokenness. And we will not be able to stop it until we have been reconciled with God, which is why I said that our faith in God is our one true advantage and our one privilege. A veil has been lifted. We now have access to our creator and we're able to work with his instructions, both for our lives as well as for his creation. We can surrender to him the control we desire so much and to relax in the fact that his plan is at play. We can rest that his purpose will prevail. It's, it's like the story of Elijah, you know that guy? When he seemed to be at the end of his rope, when he thought he was the only believer left, God told him that he had reserved 7,000 in Israel. 7,000. Not one, not two, 7,000. All whose knees who have not bowed down to Baal at every mouth that has not kissed him. And I draw my hope from that story that even when the last rhino falls, I do not need to despair. And he remains in control. And in the end, our king of kings will make everything new again. And so, my brothers and sisters, I hope that through my sharing, you were encouraged to think differently on how you approach your work, your faith, and the world around you. Many of us try to separate our spiritual from our secular life. There really isn't one. And we really shouldn't because that will be to our advantage and our privilege to bring the message of reconciliation to our fellow man and to the world around us. Thank you. Hello. First of all, I would like to thank Michael Malaysia for inviting me to talk in Integral Mission Conference. And this is my story of faith to actions. My name is Louis. I'm 29 years old from Bintulu, Sarawak. I am indigenous tribe of Iban Bidayo. I am a counselor in MEPJ or Petaling Jaya Local Council. When I was appointed in my first term, it was in 2018 and I was 26 years old at the time and also the first Dayak counsellor. I am also assistant to YB Jamalia, Adun Banda Utama. Previously, I am a former assistant to YB Yobiin. She was former Adun Damansar Utama and also former Minister of Ministry, Science, Technology and Climate Change. During my time helping out Wabi Yobin, I was the coordinator for Dun Damansara Utama Free Tuition and also Food Bank. But one of the experiences that really opened my eyes during that time was the Impian Sarawak. That time I went back to Kampung Kiding, Kuching Sarawak, and Wabi Yobin wants me to go back to help my own people and to help to build road and also bridge for the community there. Next, I also helped in Impian Malaysia. One of it is Kampung Said Pahang. For the uh, Kampung Orang Asli, we have to uh, build toilet. After that, some of the experiences that I have along the way. I helped in 11 Sarawak state elections in 2016. And one of the candidates that I helped was Mordi Bimol. At that time, he was contested for Tasik Biru Dun. After that, in 2018, YB Yobins wants me to help her as her campaign director for the 14th general election. And 
it was not easy. It's really challenging. And being one of the youngest team member in that team that time, it was very challenging. But I took it, even though I told her that I don't have the confidence to try. And because I'm very young, I'm not sure whether people will, will, will listen to me or not. But then she managed to, to make me just do it. And I know that one of the strongest supporter uh, in, in my line, in the work that I'm doing, was YBOB in, my own boss. Other experience that I helped in was in Kaniva Bonyo Dun Daman Sarutama. It was one of the best experience that I did before. Um, because I can share my culture to people, I am actually bring my culture and ask my church mates to help me in this program. And from the picture that I share, um, it is an, uh, a joy for me to share my own culture and for them to experience it. And the next one, because of the carnival Borneo, YBO Bin also asked me to help her in Carnival Tanglong, uh, the Lantern Carnival. Again, I can experience other people's culture and for me to be able to be the event director for this event, it was challenging but fun at the same time. Other than that is Carnival Rasa Sayang Malaysia, Dun Banda Utama, uh, helping out YB Jamalia. And one of the most fun experience that I have when I was in Vitamin M. During general election, we actually form a band for us to sing and also uh, we actually compose our own song um, and the album called Bina Harapan Malaysia, you can actually check that album whether in YouTube or Spotify, even iTunes and you can listen to this song. It's in Bahasa. It is very meaningful because during the 14th general election, we managed to win in this general election. But being a counsellor is not an easy task. I have a lot of challenges. One of the challenges as a young Christian counsellor is that I am young and I'm one of the youngest in MBPJ. When, when I started as a counsellor, I know that I need to bring and help my people bring uh, their issues and also concerns in um, our meetings. For me, it's not easy, but I know that uh, from this word, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Here, I would like to encourage all the young people, young Christian people out there, who, whether you are in non-government organization or in government organization. Just be yourself as a Christian. Bring your identity, your DNA in your workplace and always willing to learn. The next challenge for me is uh, as an indigenous tribe Christian counselor. It's, it's actually not, not common for Sarawakian to be a counselor in Semenanjung Malaysia or Peninsula Malaysia. But I think this Philippians 2, 3, a uh, verse which is don't be selfish don't try to impress others be humble thinking of others as better than yourself being a counselor you are given power you're given seat you're given positions but me as a person i always need to think that i'm serving the people i'm helping people and i need to to always think that me and them we are no different and uh, we are all the same in this line of work, I need to treat other people with kindness and respect. Here, I would like to encourage people to find your worth in Christ. The next challenge as a uh, counsellor is being an introvert Christian counsellor. I think this is one of the biggest challenges for me because naturally I am shy, especially to new people. Maybe some of my friends, they will thought that I don't think that you are shy, but if I in new places or meeting new people, I will feel very shy. And during my interview with YB Obin, when she was um, Adun Damasa Utama, and I went for the interview, and she, she asked me what is your strengths, and I told her, I do not know. But then she asked me, what are your weaknesses? And I told her, I have a lot of weaknesses. And she said, hmm, okay. Tell me about it. I told her I have a low self-esteem, I am shy, 
I feel awkward most of the time, especially with new people. I think that's what makes me Louis. And do not let your shyness or your introvertness sing your, your purpose. Always lean on Christ for strength and wisdom. And here in Hebrew 13.6, it says that so we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Often time, I need to talk to people. I need to confront people. Whenever people call me, they will always... Maybe those strangers, they, they do not know me personally and they will come with their issue and they will come with anger. But then I try to, to be respectful to them, um, answer them kindly. And I know that in this line of work, I need to show example to, to them. If they know me personally, I'm very sure that they will talk with me nicely. So uh, these are the things that I learned along the way as a counsellor. And the next slides, I would like to share a little bit about my journey from church to workplace. I started in this line in politics, in local council, uh, in government sector, not because I started here at first, but it's all back then when I was a student and it's all started in church. Um, in the church, I met a lot of friends. We did a lot of things, stuff, events, we call it campus life, youth ministry. I involved in praise and worship, dance, drama, all these kind of things and it was fun. From there, I get to learn about myself. I get to learn about my purpose. I get to learn about me as a Christian. And also, I get to learn about communication skill, how to talk, how to treat people. And whichever fields that you are in, do not be worried. You can always go back to church. Start there and take that as a starting platform for you. In Jeremiah 29 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I do know that this is not something that I plan. Uh, to be honest, I want to do at first, but I know that I want to help people. I want to put value into people's life. But then I know this is His plan, God's plan for me. Maybe one day I will go back and serve my Sorokian community. And as a Christian, this is the value that I always bring whenever I serve people. And I am no greater than them. I would like to encourage all people here, if you want to involve in government sector or in politics, you need to understand that we all start somewhere and you need to learn from below. And in Acts 20.35, in everything I did, I show you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, I heard this uh, back then, maybe a few years back. And I know that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Whenever you give, remember that you are more blessed. And we are all broken people, but we are blessed by the same God, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. God bless. Shalom. Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is Pauline. My journey with people with disabilities began 28 years ago in Malaysian care. My role in the area of special needs is working closely with families to provide support, equip, empower, and develop people with learning disabilities with relevant skills to reach their potentials, full potentials with independent living skills and to have a gainful employment. My work involves collaborating with teachers, churches, the government agencies and other NGOs to develop the services and to enhance the quality of the services for the well-being of the people with learning disabilities. Leaving the corporate world 28 years ago to join Malaysian Care was my first step of faith into action. So my desire to know God deeply led me to seek His purpose for my life and into this ministry. One of the books that inspired me a lot is uh, to serve people with disabilities ministry was Adam, God's Beloved, written by Henry Nowen. Well, in his experience living with a young man with severely disabilities at La Arche Daybreak community in Canada, his view of life in God's change. 
So initially, I thought that it's a sacrifice life to serve the Lord. But after I read that book and my experiences with people with disabilities, my whole perspective changed. I'm so blessed to be part of God's story being called to serve people with disabilities. And I gained so much more than I can imagine. Not in terms of monetary like my corporate friends do, but I got something much more valuable. And through the people with disabilities, they flourish my spiritual experience with God. Wendy, not her real name, has learning disabilities. She's now working at one of the hypermarkets in Kuala Lumpur. Many years ago, as I was working with her, training her, I told her mom that she needs to learn to take public transport on her own. So her mom took my advice and we started to train her to take public transport. And a month later, her mother passed away. So now she can independently taking her own trans public transport to work. So you see, God loves her very much and knows her future. Even though I'm her trainer and teacher, she always brings me joy whenever I visit her at her workplace. She never fails to call me, you know, to wish me happy birthday every year. Yeah, and this is such a beautiful and a reciprocal relationship between us. Given opportunity to people with disabilities, they can know God, depend on God, they can work and live a meaningful life. All they need is opportunities and friends. I remember once working one-to-one -one with a girl with severely disabilities at a gospel camp in USA. One morning I was inspired to sing a song like, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's just a simple song to encourage her that Jesus loves her very much. No matter what her conditions, you know, she is, even though she can't speak and she needs to depend on people to take care of her daily basic, you know, needs. God loves her and knows her needs. So to my amazement, she sang along with me with her smile and I felt the presence of God. Wow. I pray with so many people before, but here, this girl with severely disabilities, she never smiled due to the stiffness of her face muscle. But she smiled that day. And I tell you, for the first time, I felt the powerful presence of God just overwhelm both of us and embrace us in the arms of Jesus. What a privilege. And I shed tears that morning with a joy. And she smiled. Really, God loves her so much. And people thought that they are nothing. But God valued her so much that he turned up in our midst. I just tumpang only, you know, just get a share. Another story is I used to work with a family friends to help their sons with physical therapies. Um, their son has cerebral palsy and intellectual disabilities. Sometimes I would spend time with him so that the parents can take a break. Many may think that is a sacrificial task, but do you know that I'm the one that receives so much blessing? The Lord used his mouth to turn your sorrow into joy, just like Henry Nolan experienced his experience with Adam. With him, I had a supernatural encounter with God, which too long, too long a story to tell, to share in these sessions. Well, another story is a family with three teenagers' children with severely disabilities. Honestly, my team and I do not know how to help them besides praying with them, provide some food provisions, and also meet, visit them once in a while. But to our amazement, the Lord's helps always arrive at the right timing as we rely in Him. This family taught us God's compassion and love. People with disabilities have become an important part of my life experience, positively impacting me daily. Whenever they see me, they will greet me, hug me, call me, call my name, and love me and accept me as I am. 
sometimes I don't feel deserving, but they never judge or you know condemn. But they, but they often so forgiving. They are a precious hidden treasure in the eyes of God. Through them, God display His love, His grace, and His power, bringing glory to Him. They inspire me to be of myself. They show me what it means to love resiliently and abundantly. Do you remember the story of Peter walks on water? In Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 23. The disciples were out on a boat in a lake. Then came a strong wind and storm. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, they saw someone walking over to them on water. And they were so scared at first. But then the person called out, Hey, it's me. And it was Jesus. Jesus was walking on the lake. Jesus told them not to worry. Then Peter asked Jesus, if he could come and join him on the water. And Jesus called and Peter responded immediately. So he stepped out of the boat and began to walk on water. So I believe all the disciples heard Jesus calling, but only Peter took the step. So only Peter experienced a supernatural walk on water. So in all we do, it's important to focus on Jesus. So it is the same with us. Are we there to take the first step like Peter when we know our calling? Do not need to worry. Just focus on Jesus and the Holy Spirit will just journey with us. So I hope my story inspires you to take the first step. I have much to share but because of time, I can only share this much. Thank you and enjoy your session. Thank you so much, panelists. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to panel session two, Stories of Faith to Action. Now, you, what you have just heard is um, four of our panelists, and um, they share about their testimony, their struggle, their faith to action. And I think the short video captured their real-life testimonies and challenges of their journey into making their faith one that is living, one that is active in bringing transformation into the different arenas of life. So thank you so much, and welcome, Rama. Jeannie, Louise, and Pauline for your sharing. And I'm sure the participants have enjoyed hearing your stories and might have further comments. Um, a lot of um, questions and comments are already coming in. Just a reminder to all participants, you can post your questions to VVOX at the link given to you on the chat. And if you see a question that you, you two want to find out more and you're interested for the panelists to give a response to, you can upvote the question. And of course, if time permit us, we will attempt asking the panelists all the questions. Um, but looking at our time, we only have 30 minutes. Uh, we'll do our best, but we will focus mostly on the upvoted questions Yeah. So if you like a question, please do vote it and we will get the panelists to answer that. Now on my screen very quickly, um, there are many, many good questions, but I'm going to ask the most upvoted question first. And the first question is actually directed to Rama. How are you Rama? How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Now, I think this is really a really a good question um, because um, I think it also resonated with mine. And I think um, it's due to what you said um, earlier in your recording. You mentioned that you've achieved very little in these six years of activism. And, and one of your achievements was that you've been investigated by the police several times, mainly for speaking out during protests in an article that you wrote. You wrote. Now, being investigated by the police several times for standing for justice and speaking out against things that are blatantly wrong. How, how have those experiences shaped you? And this question is really good. You say you haven't made much difference and your work seems to be a high risk. What spiritual practices or aspects of your faith carry you on the days, if you have them, where you want to give up? So did you, you know, this, did those experiences make you more infuriated with, with our governance and justice system? Did you ever stop and think that's it, throw in the towel, this is too costly? Um, and if the if I may follow up, you know, what, what, what do your wife, your family think about your faith in action and the risk that you take by getting involved in such a way? Well, let me let me start with the last part first. Uh, I'm very blessed to have a wife who thinks that I should be doing what I'm doing uh, and you know is willing to accept the risk uh, that people think goes with it. Uh, but in all honesty, um, 
I feel that the risk uh, to what I am doing is very small uh, compared to what happens to uh, a lot of the people on on you know for whom I campaign and, and for whom I I write the people I write about. I mean, when I think about the hardships uh, of the families of the EO6 and their friends when they were uh, held, you know, for over 20 days, uh, I think it's nothing compared to going to Bukit Aman uh, police headquarters and holding a candle and just being photographed. Uh, because you have that certainty that, you know, you're standing for what's right. But, uh, I mean, when you talk about spiritual practices, um, in all honesty, I think it's a it's a kind of a you know loss of appetite. I mean, I, I'm I'm almost reluctant to say fasting. So it's it's like a loss of appetite. It's like oh no, these things are going to happen. Uh, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I'm being called up. Sometimes they come. You know, like I've had police come to my home and take my computer and my phone. Uh, there are times when I get a bit nervous, but then I say to myself, well, this is my calling, uh, and. I feel very comfortable doing these things. Uh, and sometimes I think the fear factor is, is really overrated. Um, because from an activist standpoint, in a way you want the police to come and investigate you. Uh, you, want, you want to be called up because you know that it will you know, upset people even more. Uh, and just as uh, the detention of the EO6 uh, and, and in the horrible thing that happened to Teo Beng Hock, mm turn me into an activist, I hope that me being called and so on will turn other people, uh, you know, will switch other people on, so to speak. Um, mm. Yeah. All right. So you, you actually welcome those harassment in that yeah. sense. I actually, I actually <laughs> that do. was like the end goal of you being protesting outside of the police headquarters and all that. Yeah. yeah. But it's great to hear from you that, um, you know, like the first person, uh, um, first, uh, first the, the, rec the report from you that, um, being an activist and um, stand up for it and there will be implication for doing that and to to hear that you know you have support from your loved ones and I think that's really helpful in your journey of faith into action as well. Thank you so much Rama for sharing that part. Um, we move on to Ginny. Um, Ginny there's a question for you. Um, to what extent you think the church is with you in terms of making a difference in this area of creation care? Now um, I'm like any one of us here who are in an um, evangelical church. Um, I come from an evangelical church. Um, and it seems to me that we, we, growing up in church, creation care is not something that we talk a lot about in church. Um, I mean, we praise God, we read the book of Psalms, and that's about it, a lot of us, right? And for you today, it's hot, heartwarming to hear how you, you deal with rhinos and um, you inform us how many of them are dying and they are like an endangered species. So this question is really good. Like how do you think the church is with you? Do you think the church is praying for you, for people who are in your profession, for, for people who are who are environmentalists like yourself? Do you think that is um, it's a theology problem that people don't talk much about it in church? Or is it just that, you know, somebody will take care of it. We are all going to die anyway. God is going to make new heaven and new earth. So just want to hear this part of um, I'm sharing from you, Jeannie. Oh, uh, that's a very uh, packed question. So uh, definitely um, throughout sort of, you know, the 20 years of my working life, unfortunately, I have to say, there are very few and far between Christians whom I have encountered in my circle. Most of the people who work in this field are atheists, right? Because I think in much earlier on, there's always this thought that there's a separation between science and religion. And I think it's similar in churches where we, we adopt a similar stance, right? There's a separation between science, there's a separation between um, evangelizing to the people and caring for the environment. But I think we do need to shift that now because you cannot care for the people in a vacuum right? You need to also see where they are and what their needs are. And a lot of times, a lot of these people will not care of what you have to say until you understand where they are coming from. And 
I have to say uh, the, the demographics of an urban church makes it very difficult for the people in church. It is a reflection of our co community as well, because yeah, we are so separated from the environment, right? We buy our, our pr produce, our, our stuff from the market, from the supermarket. We don't see where, they're t where they are from, right? We don't see where the plants are from. In fact, uh, many years ago, um, there was a study that said that a lot of children can recognize 10, immediately 10 market brands, but they cannot recognize one plant from the other, right? So it is a reflection. What church is thinking is a reflection of the community that we serve. And I think um, that's where we do need to change, right? And it, it's, there's many, many things. There's how we educate our children, how we need to be aware of uh, where a lot of the things are uh, from. Like when you buy a shoe, it's not in vacuum, right? When you talk to the people that you are reaching out to, uh, you want to evangelize to, you cannot talk to them as if they live nowhere, as if they come from nowhere. So you need to understand these things. Um, so yes, the church needs a lot of, uh, there's a need to have that link to the church, which is, which is why I, I keep saying, why I say that there really isn't a separation between our faith and what we do, you know. I think one of the other lessons I learned is, am I a Christian first or am I a working person, a professional first? Mm. And, and it really brought me to stop to think, to say, actually, I am a Christian who is a conservationist, mm. not the other way around. Okay. You basically are saying that you, you allow your faith also to define what you do. You, you let your faith um, be the guiding light and factor in how you do what you're doing in conservation, yes. right? That All is right. how, yeah, because um, just to add, because... Once you do that, then you see the people as whom, how Jesus sees us and mm. sees them. Right? And that needs to change. That needs to shift. And okay. when it happens, it becomes easier for you to integrate that into your working life. Sure. Thanks, Jeannie. Uh, there, there is a follow-up question to that, but I'll, I'll get back to you a little bit later. Let's just go to our young man who's looking really good today, Louis. <laughs> Are you on a um, PPE suit? Yes, I am. <laughs> oh, can you speak at the moment? Am I, are we like yes. disturbing you like in action? Yes, I can speak. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Louise. You are such an inspiration agreeing with um, what this um, questioner has just been um, posted on a question um, for you. Um, they just were... I think it's a very personal question. I think it's also because you're sharing a very personal... You talk about how you arrive at your 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 current position right now as a like you know 26 a dayak counselor um, it's really such an inspiration for all of us to hear that um, so this question we're asking how do you know that where you are now is god's calling for you and not just something that you want um, like that sense of calling that you know that this is this is what god wants me to do um, and if i'm not mistaken i heard you saying something about um, you could even go back to sarawak to serve your community after this um, you're just like waiting upon the Lord to, to speak about that. So this could be just a stepping stone for you to learn all the experience. Um, but yeah, would you just um, share with us, like um, in summary, how do you know that you, you are living out his, his story and not merely is something that you, you know, in your mind, you are creating on your own, projecting it into this is being God's calling. So um, what do you say to this? Okay. Hi, uh, Pastor Alexa and everyone here. Okay, so um, to be honest, this has been the question that I ask, I ask myself, I think almost every year. <laughs> In fact, when I was, um, um, I, when I worked with uh, Wabio Bean, I was 22 at the time, and now I'm 29. So I have never changed my job. It's just different positions um, since I was uh, 22 until 29. And every year I will, tell myself that, okay, I want to, to, to do something else. I want to try something else. And uh, to be honest, I do not know uh, whether this is what I really want. I, I know that I want to help people. 
and this is the platform that that uh, God has given to me uh, to be able to help people. And um, just like, um, yeah, I, I'm not in my final destination yet. This is just a part of the path that I have to go through. I do know that uh, greater things are waiting for me um, in front. And, um, or I, I shall say that this path is also the destination that I have to, to, to go through. Um, you know, one destination, uh, after that, I have to go to another destination. Mm. So, yeah, <laughs> I think it's, um, it's something that we, we, as a Christian, we must believe the process. Uh, this is the process that, that I know that I have to learn. And uh, it's something that um, I know I have to learn a lot of things. And I'm, when I started, I'm also very young. Yeah, So a lot of things I have to learn from all of you as well. Yes. All right. So, so if if um, if I may just um, summarize what your thought was like, it's not so much about like you know you wake up in the morning and God speaking to you that oh this is this is your calling for you, Louis, or like you know two years from now you know while we are bathing and then suddenly God just <laughs> appeared to you and say go back to Sarawak. It's more like a process of of discovering while you do what is plainly clear from the scripture, and that is just do good to all people that in your influence. And yes. I think you are in an area of influence. And, um, and I think the next question, um, if I may continue to ask you, would be, um, I think, and this is for you, I think, um, do you have to navigate situations of bribery or corruption? Um, I know that this question is asking all the panelists. <laughs> um, I do not know whether Rama, have you ever like been tempted to give the police who's going to arrest you bribery? Um, but maybe I'll just hear from Louis as a counselor. Do you, do you have to navigate situations of bribery and corruption? And how does your faith shape the way you engage with the situation? Basically, I think it's asking um, the, the issue integrity. How do you keep yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you keep this area integrity um, as you face situation like that? All right, so um, maybe I just share a little bit about what, uh, when I started as a counselor, I think when I was um, a few months after I appointed as counselor, when I was 26, and there is this one, uh, one of the residents that came to me and then he told me that, um, Louis, why don't we, this is very, uh, I, I'm just sharing, okay? Um, why don't, you know, um, you approve this project and then after that the money i will you know we can bagi bagi uh uh 30% you 30% me or 40% you after that uh, another you know the remaining percent go to the contractor but then uh, i told him that um, i'm really sorry i think you know me well that i will not do this kind of things um I, I, I'm I kindly uh, declined the, the offer and I have to tell them because we are the, the people who not only talk for ourselves but also for the party, for the, for the uh, bosses that up there, you know, uh, my YB and MBPJ as well, as well as because I, I am a Christian and the community mm -hmm. leader. So I have to lead by example and by telling them that uh, I'm really sorry, I cannot help you with this and this these are the things uh it's wrong yeah so yeah that, that's how i i uh, handle the the situation mm, thank you thank you for sharing that so so this kind of situation uh, has arisen before in, in in the context of your work and um it's inspiring to hear that you you um are able to to stand firm and to navigate your way uh, through that uh, supposedly what we call uh, also crisis uh, during work. Um, but thank you for sharing that, 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 that story with us. Um, for Pauline, um, yeah, before I go into this question, question just, a, just a thought from me, would you just you, you share a little bit about uh, there's a lot of collaboration that you, you, you work with churches, uh, NGO, um, and as well as governmental body. Um, would you share with us how has this been? Um, is it challenging? Uh, do you get enough support from, from people that you speak with? Uh, is it difficult to, 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 to work with such bodies? Or you are welcome with open hand and they see you as a, this saintly angel and, who, who, and can't wait to work with you? I guess, uh, yeah, for working with uh, the government agencies, uh, we do face uh, some challenges uh, because of our, our logo. You look at Malaysian camp logo, we have a cross. 
so uh so many times that uh whenever we uh go for a meeting so this always uh the emphasize like right? you're a christian okay mm. so um of course um there are some questions okay will will throw to us and uh, but the, the the good thing is uh that we are able to share uh, and display uh god's uh, love and uh, integrity so i remember like uh, we talk about the bribery and corruptions uh, in one of the projects uh, we we had with them um, and because the fundings come from them as well uh, so so one of the, the the officers two of the officers actually did mention that oh why not we do this and that uh, basically is to benefit them so but then I, we say, and I said, no, it should be uh, in uh, according to what we have discussed in the project. So, but at the end, uh, they actually commented something which very encouraging. They say that, oh, wow, well, I um, we feel that in any uh, funding, we should actually uh, fund Malaysian Cares project if we work with them because uh, they uh, really manage the funds very well, you know. So this is one of the testimonies that uh, that um, I heard from them. I see. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this uh, what you shared just uh, nicely flow into the question that is um posted. Um, it says here if God's story involves restoring relationship, which we have established that, then our approach must be relational. And yours clearly seems to be all this cooperation and um just collaboration with different people. Um, however, many large organizations are concerned about staff having relationship with program beneficiaries. Um, so how does your organization, Malaysian Care, in this uh, regard, navigate this um, relationship? Um, and have you ever have to dealt with the tension between a relational approach and having a safe boundaries with um, um, the organization that you work with? Uh, definitely they are, okay, but um, as, when we look at we ourselves as professionals, uh, we basically journey with clients like, I mean, basically we don't journey with clients. They only see us like, okay, probably nine to five or two hours. Yeah, but we, if we were to journey with our beneficiaries, it's beyond, um, beyond, beyond uh, our professionalism. So like, uh, of course, there are ethical issues that we need to observe. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> so in our organization, we do have policies that to govern uh, the relationship, all right? Yep. But uh, not to the extent that uh, we, we are, um, they, they disrupt our, our journey with our clients to support them. Yeah. So like, for example, uh, in early years, like we, we don't really think about that. We just love our, our uh, beneficiaries, our uh, people that comes to us. So even then, the parents will ask, why, why, why do you love us, love our child with disability so much? You know, so mm. they don't see it. That's where we are able to share uh, the love of God to them. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. I think um, it's not just Malaysian here. I think organization that seeks to do this work, like you said, they they have a policy that um that will ensure certain um structural boundary are being drawn um between you and the you seek to minister even as a pastor myself there are certain policy you know as to like how do we minister to people without crossing certain boundary that we're not supposed to cross yeah um for genie and rama these are this is an interesting question um both of you seem to be working in contexts where friends might be in short supply and enemies abound <laughs> that's true um genie do you have like enemies abound in your line of work uh, I wouldn't say, no, I don't have enemies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking, do the rhino like charge you and are they like your <laughs> enemies? Well, I, I, if you talk to me offline, I can tell you an elephant story, but they're not uh, my enemies. Yeah. Um, I think it's not so much as enemies as in people with very yeah. different agendas. Everyone, sure. right, have yeah. their own needs. Mm. You talk to... Um, and I think I've been very uh, blessed, I think, probably through wisdom from God that I can see through. Of course, when everybody comes to a table and discuss things, there's always this notion of fear. 
yeah. know, year of loss. Mm. Uh, if I give away this mm. concession of chorus or whatever, I will lose out on the economy and all that. You mm. just need to peel away that past that fear and look at what exactly is it that's driving their demands. Mm. And, and I think over time I've managed to to work through that, right? And um, but definitely the people whom we work together with with similar uh, agendas, there's almost like a brother in arms, I have ah, to say. Okay. So I do have a network of friends whom we are very close together because we uh, we have this similar goal that we strive towards. Okay. And yes, it is as if at a certain point in time it is us against everybody else. But Just against the wall. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, there's not many Christians in that field, uh, mm. which um, really is quite disheartening. But um, hopefully through this conference, I can, I can uh, aspire, inspire some people to think of how in your different fields you can actually have change, right? But bear in mind that there are no enemies. It's just people with different needs. Yeah, we yep. just need to drill down on saying what is it that they fear mm. and what is it that drives them. Mm. Mm. And figuring that out along the way, right? Yeah. Correct. But Rama, do you do you see people who oppose necessarily your enemies? And if they are, how do you how do you respond to to those groups? Yeah, um, it's it's a great question, uh, and it's one that I have given some thought to. Um, I don't think I can say specifically who the enemies are, but mm -hmm. I'm very clear that there are that there is an enemy, uh, and that enemy works in very many different ways. Um, so sometimes the the enemy seems to be the you know lack of interest of most people uh, in social justice. Uh, that that you know it's like sometimes you feel very alone doing what you do. Uh, especially in the Christian community, because people are um, kind of used to a, a different way of service uh, mm. and the service of bandaging wounds and so on is somewhat easier uh, to do. Um, although for me, it's much more difficult. Uh, I could not do what some of the other panelists do. Uh, it's mm. not me. I'm not that. I'm not made for that. So I think we're all made for different tasks. Um, but friends, uh, you know, about 15 months ago, I was called for questioning uh, in Bukit Aman, uh, and and I was just amazed by the people who came. I mean, it was during. Uh, it was on a work day uh, in the afternoon during office hours. And I was totally amazed at some of the people who came there just to show support. Mm. Uh, these are people who had never been to a public display of feelings, uh, had never been, uh, you know, to a protest even in Dataran Merdeka. Mm. And here they were; they came to Bukit Aman Police Headquarters. So what I know is that you know there are people uh, who are very much in prayer for me, and who will show up and be photographed by the special branch, just as I have been. And so I find that you know just a few people coming it just makes me, just makes me so encouraged. Uh, so in terms of enemies, I would say the other thing is a lot of what I do involves uh, abuse of power by police, and. I cannot honestly say that any police officer has said to me, stop what you're doing, uh, with the possible exception of the former mm -hmm. Inspector General of Police. Uh, I mean, he, he told me and Cage to, you know, shut our bloody mouths. Uh, the, the, those are his exact words. Wow. So, no, I, I think that uh, praying for enemies is something that um, I think often about, but sometimes I'm really not sure who the enemy is, because I certainly don't want to pray for Satan. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's uh, something that, you know, I'm still trying to figure out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, as, as both of you were, were, were talking, and at least all the four panelists here, I, I, I do think that um, something that we have not uh, spoke on, I think all of you share a little bit of struggles, there are challenges. And of course, you know, the video can be sharing all the struggles and challenges that are that, that you have gone through. Um, but one thing that I felt um, maybe we could um, speak to the listeners and ask all 
four panelists to share this is that, and I, and I will use Jeannie's story as the base. You know, when she, it really, it really touched my heart uh, when I, when I, when I watched that, when she said that when the last rhino in Sabah died, um, it, it really hit your heart so much that you question how much your work actually changed things. Um, and you said that no, that no matter how much you try, it almost seems like a losing battle. Um, and I think uh, um, all four panelists could have gone, could have experienced those moments in your life that, you know, what on earth am I doing this? It's been the third year and my rhino still died or, you know, people still dying in custody. Um, you know, people are still dealing with disabilities. Uh, people are still giving corruption, you know, in all these different uh, field that you are in. Um, and all these moments sound like self-doubt and despair. Um, and of course, you know, you shared the story about how the story with Elijah helped you to get over it. But I'm just wondering out loud, how often does this self-doubt actually coexist with our desire and our faith to see things change in our field? Um, and, and what helps you through those difficult times? Um, was it purely the commandment of the Lord to stay put, to persevere? Um, was it a community that uh, will be there to support us? You know, hearing from Jeannie, she doesn't even have that Christian community that walk with her. How, how do you then keep on with this path of persevering, doing what is right and what is good and what God has called you to be? So um, maybe we'll just get all the four panelists to share this part. Um, uh, Louise or Pauline, you want to go first? All right, so as I shared in my uh, presentation earlier, I'm not someone with, you know, I'm, I'm very, I have very low self-esteem and I, every day I would, you know, uh, for example, like uh, this morning, I would, you know, I woke up and then I would doubt myself whether I can, you know, do the things that I have to do today. Like this program, I, I need to lead this program, COVID-19 test. And there are people uh, under me, the clinics, you know, and there are older people, and also doctors, and when I think about myself, who am I? So, um, but before I go to work, I, I just read this um, uh, Bible verse, uh, talk about Moses, how God says uh, to, to, the, to the people, uh, come to the, to the uh, uh, Gunung Sinai, right? Uh, go to the Gunung Sinai, and then, but then before you come, you have to uh, cleanse your clothes, and you have, uh, you know, when God speak uh, the the voice of the thunder and then the the um, a lot of things happens you know gunung bergegar right so when I think about that that it's no it's not about me again it's not about me it's really about God you know he he walked in front of me and then he is behind me beside me and um, if I depending on my own uh, strength my own wisdom my own power. I, I really have none of that. And when, when, when I, depending on God, I know that I can go through everything. So uh, obviously, God is my only strength. And of course, the, the church communities, my cell, uh, cell group. Mm. Uh, every week, I will meet my friends. And then they are the, the people who, you know, uh, will, um, will uh, strengthen me. And there are times when I... Uh, I, I was in depression as well. This is very personal. I was in depression. Yeah. So uh, they, they know the, the position that I was in that time. And uh, these people also the one who, who you know, strengthened me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I would, um, you know, ask people who really need strength, wisdom, ask from God and um, go to the church. And there, there will be communities, especially if you can, you know, friends that become families that can strengthen you. Yeah. Thanks, Louise. Pauline? Yeah, many times I do doubt, um, like, I do ask God, like, why, why, God, why do you create people with disabilities? You know, why they have to suffer? You know, but in, in a way that God didn't create them because, but because due to the sin of man, the fall, you know, so, of men. Uh, so, so then there's one day I hear very clearly and the Holy Spirit really spoke to my heart. He said, the existence of the people with disabilities is because to teach people like me to learn how to love, to love with compassion. 
So that really, wow, that, that day I was like really cry, you know, and really touched because as we work journey with families who have disability, children with disabilities, especially families who have not one, not two, but some of them, there are five children with disabilities. And you could see that one by one, they, they, they just died, you know, because you know that they, we, just, we just couldn't help. But what can we do? But is to really, you know, support uh, the, um, the parents, the families emotionally, and, uh, and also just love them. So, um, yeah, so this is my, my part of my story. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, Jeannie or Rama, which one of you want to go first? Maybe uh, Rama, you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, I must say that uh, I actually don't get uh, frustrated or disappointed very often. Mm. It is, of course, upsetting, you know, not to see results. Um, to see, um, you know, I, I, it's this idea of the three mile an hour God, uh, you know, Kosuke Koyama, the theologian, he wrote mm -hmm. a book that he titled Three Mile an Hour God. And I worked in the corporate world for years, over 30 years, I worked in big multinationals, very, very results oriented, goal oriented, key performance indicators, you know, you want to get a very good uh, appraisal at the end of the year, get promoted, and I went up the ladder that way. Uh, so results are very important to me. So to me, it is just astonishing uh, that I have peace. Because I can tell you, if I if I, if my results in industry had been what they are now, uh, I'd be a basket case. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd have been sacked. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it's it's a sense of peace uh, and knowing that, OK, the results aren't there, but strangely, there is peace. And ultimately, it is about knowing that the battle has been won. You know, there's a book that Ponsonby wrote. Uh, in the end, he wins. You know, in the end, God wins. Or in the end, we win. So there is that certainty. And so, despite you know the kind of small failures or no no results, I just think we're in this for the long run. We're in the right place. Uh, we believe that you know we would be a lot less happy if we were at home. So that's basically you know how I I for me that's what it is being okay. in the right place. Yep. Thank you, Rama, for sharing that. Jeannie? Well, you pick uh, a topic that's uh, really, really um, kind of emotional for me because, yes, it truly, truly did uh, spark or sort of triggered what you call my crossroads or crossroads moment. Um, but I think the advantage, I saw the advantage because I was, you know, I was very close to this guy who was working directly with the Rhino program. And he's not a believer, right? So he dedicated almost 15 years of his life to try and sort of make more rhino babies. Mm. Um, I wasn't directly involved and I was hit hard. I cannot imagine what he was going through. He is, uh, you know, already a, quite a very old naturalist and so on. And, and you can imagine, right, if you're 70 something and what you've worked for for most of your life died out, you know, what was the, what would be the impact? Mm -hmm. And I felt sad because he is a non-believer. Whereas I had the advantage of crawling back to God and saying, you know, lamenting to him, going back to a father and lamenting to him why, why, why this happened? And then the, the joy, the miracle of it is that he then opened his doors and showed me, oh, but you may think of it, you, you can only see this moment, this point in time. But, you know, like Elijah, you know, he had reserved these, these other priests, he has other plans, his plan prevails, right? So we may despair at the moment, but it's because we are physical beings and only at that moment we see this. But we can trust in a God who has a much larger plan, who is much more powerful than the apathy in the world, the corruption in the world. And like, like Ram was saying, the battle has been won. And the hope there is what 
you know, sort of reignited my my uh, my passion. It's mm. like you know, otherwise it'd be like, oh, I give up. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, I. What's the point? Right. The world is going down in flames if you read Revelations. <laughs> but no, the hope keeps me going to say, but until then, until the point when we see His coming again. We just keep got to go. We just keep got to going, you know, keep going where we need to go. And because we have him, he is there to be able to show to us what other people cannot see. You know, the truths he reveals to us, mm. it's not available to those who are non-believers. And that is where we also then need to bring this message to those despairing people. If you think it's tough for us, it's tougher for them who don't have God, you know? So that's, that's what spurred me on to say, hey, I am so blessed. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ginny. Thank you all four panelists. And I think that's a fitting end for our um, panel two session. Um, really, really think that this is such a good conversation that we got it going. Um, as the, all the panelists have shared how their faith plays a role in um, making them continue to persevere in um, acting as God's agent, in bringing, um, bringing change, a transformation in the field that um, all of you are in. Um, there's a question that I really like, uh, I didn't get to ask, but I thought it would be very fitting for us to end with this question, asking about ourselves. Um, what things about God's story that four of our panelists have shared uh, taught us today? You know, I'm, I'm mindful of today's um, living God's story. Um, it, it's not just to hear about testimonies and, um, and while these are all really good theological, biblical understanding of mission, mission of God, and how we are all in God's story. I think that one of the bigger purpose of the conference is that we hope that this will serve as a catalyst for more of God's people involvement um, in areas that have been spotlighted, in areas that have not been spotlighted. And I hope that um, the sharing by the panelists has greatly inspired us to move ourselves to be God's agent in area that God has placed in our heart. So I just wanna say a big thank you to four of you. Thank you for uh, sharing from your heart, your journey, um, the struggles and the, the, the the, the little victories that we have won and all with that in mind that God has won the battle for us, but we can continue to do the work that has set, that God has set before us. So thank you, Rama, Ginny, Louise, and Pauline. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for all the um, participants. I know that I'm, I'm well aware there are a lot of questions that we didn't get to answer and they are all good questions. I don't know what we can do about it, but um, I just want to thank you for your participation. Please stay on for uh, the rest of the session by Dr. Chris Wright. And I believe that it will be equally inspiring, if not more, um, to be able to help all of us to propel to join and live God's story, uh, each in our own individual, individual way. Thank you so much for this. <laughs>